Hey, good morning. All right, so the first thing I want to do is, oh, well, that's, I'll have to do that later. All right, so the first thing I want to do is I want to briefly go over what's being expected for Friday. So Friday is the midterm exam, and I have posted the exam review on the course webpage. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to find it, go over the first things like the expectations, and then show you how it is that you can use this to study for the test. So if you go to the course lecture page, Lecture 21 is the exam, and I have this link here that says exam study guide and review. So if you click on it, it hopefully download a little faster. So this is the full exam review guide. So the first thing I have here is the concepts from the course objectives that are listed in the uh, Notre Dame course guide that will be evaluated on this test. And this is the overall statement. This course introduces students to computational thinking. So a number of the questions that I've been using, and you'll recognize the format because this is what we've been doing in the uh, lecture review problems throughout the entire semester. It tests how it is that you're able to see not just the program does something, but how you can use it to accomplish a certain task. And develop your ability to solve engineering problems in software. Students will learn structured programming, algorithm analysis, and development. So we haven't quite gotten to algorithm analysis, but we have started with this idea of sorting. So we did merge sort. So there will be a couple of merge sort related questions on the exam. So we're going to touch on it, but the second half of the semester is where we go into algorithm analysis in a lot more detail. There will be a lot of questions regarding C syntax and semantics. Logical and syntactical debugging, we're gonna start doing that today. Software engineering fundamentals. So things, you know, can you understand what a pointer is? Can you understand about functions? Do you understand the difference between pass by value and pass by reference? How it is that we allocate memory and why it is we want to allocate memory to do certain tasks. All right, so how will the exam be given? The exam will be given the exact same way you've been doing the quizzes throughout the semester of the uh, quizzes, with the homework review assignments. It will be through the Sakai tool. It will be in the exact same format. It will be in multiple choice, just like you've been practicing all semester. So the goal is through those assignments, you will, you will get uh, some exposure to the exact exam format with the goal that there should be no surprise when you start the exam as to what the format should be and the type of questions I'm going to ask. So you have to be in this room to take it. Unless you have, unless you're under quarantine or you have an exemption or not an exemption, but you have some accommodation from the Sarah B Center. And I got the list of those students this morning. Or you're an off-campus student, you must be in here. I have an IP lock. So I know the IP address that goes through the set of IP addresses that are accessed through the laptops. So you have to be in the room. So no other exemptions will be granted. The exam will be visible five minutes before class, before class starts. So it will be visible on Sakai at 9.05. And then the exam will be, it will no longer be visible. It will actually cut you off and save your current state of work for promptly at 10 o'clock. Like so. So the exam format will be just like the review problems. It will be multiple choice questions. So throughout the semester, you probably noted that I had several star star questions. And what I have here in this review is that set of questions as well as my explanation as to the answer. So each question will have exactly one correct answer unless otherwise stated. So if I say that there are three correct answers, you have to make three choices to make your full credit. Um, I do note, note here that I will be having partial credit so for example, let's say I have a question where you do calculate some sort of recursive result and the end, let's say the answer is 20, right? But then the F for F statement has percent X, so I'm expecting an hexadecimal and 20 is one of the choices. You don't catch that, you put 20, that's a part of you. Make sure that's partial credit because you demonstrated that you can go through recursive trace. So there, 
I, for so questions like that, I will identify if you were able to guess that that you have a a at least partial understanding of the answer. On this review guide, each question has a expected time. So when you're practicing, you want to try to make sure that you can do these questions within the expected time frame. So I'm still kind of tweaking. The exam, I want to make sure that it's uh, correct and fair. I was, uh, the thing that I struggle with the most when I uh, write exams is, have I made this fair enough? Is it, have I made it too hard? Have I made it too easy? You, know, you always want to find a good middle ground between making sure that it's, uh, that it's robust and it's testing your full set of knowledge. But I don't like, for example, I don't do trick questions. I don't, and I don't want to make the exam uh, so difficult that no one can get, um, a good grade. I'll give you a quick story. Uh, when I took graduate algorithms at USF, we had a professor who kind of mentally checked out. And uh, I got a 55 on the final, and that was the second highest score in any student class. So I don't think that's the kind of exam that's fair. Uh, you, you know, it's, it, it's I, I want to make sure that the uh, average is, is uh, good and reflective of, of your understanding. So it's a uh, closed book. You can't use any websites, books, homework, notes. You, know, you can't call upon uh, have, uh, any Hogwarts models to bring you answers or any other magic that I might not have considered. Um, can't phone a friend, can't do anything like that. No smoke signals, can't use your class notes. Um, and then, so here's the part where I have to be mean. If we catch you, it's an automatic zero on the test. It's not worth it. It's not worth it to get two more questions right that you might not know. Um, the rest of it is exam study guide questions. Each question, I have the problem statement, the expected time, and a list of choices, and then a video that contains the answer. So you can use this kind of as a flashcard. So here's an example, simple example, subtract 15 from seven, and I have the choices, and then I have this video here that I can play. Oh, okay. Subtract 15 from 7 and return the binary result in two sum to six places, including the sign. So here's how you do it. For subtraction, remember that 7 would be on the top, and that 7 is going to be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. Then we're going to subtract 15. The way you do this in two complement is you have 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1 for 15. And then you have to flip all those bits and then add one. So now we do this. We do one, one, zero, 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 one. And then you add them together. So you get zero, 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 one, one, one. So therefore, the answer is A. So I have that type of setup for every single one of these questions. So let me go down. So I have 44 sample questions, of which there are 44 sample videos that go through the exact process. But not only will you be able to have know the right answer, but I'm not going to give these exact questions, right? But you will actually know the computational thought process, going back to the uh, course description, that allow you to solve that for variance on the problem. Okay, so does anybody have any questions about the about the exam? I think right now I have it, it's about 32 questions, but I'm kind of tweaking that. Yes. Today's lecture will not be on the test. I was literally going to be the next thing I was about to say, but yes. Uh, the today's lecture is not on the exam. And if you look at the uh, lecture, it says lectures one through, oh I, oh, I have one through 20 on there. My apologies, I thought I could have sworn I said one through 19. I will fix that right now as I'm rambling about the rest of it. Does anybody have any other questions about uh, the upcoming exam? All right, so what we're going to do today is we are going to discuss top-down design and we're going to have an introduction to debugging. So what I mean by this is that up to this point, you've been basically learning C syntax, 
you've been learning about pointers, you've been learning a little bit about the architecture, you've been learning a little bit about how to implement codes, and you've worked on some fairly uh, interesting, you know, you've worked on some projects and were able to uh, do some tasks. So the thing with challenges that are, uh, for students that are new to coding, is this idea of computer science as a science. And that there's not always one fully correct answer. When we get to the second half of the semester and we start looking at the C++ standard template libraries, you want to make choices and trade-offs based on computing performance versus the amount of memory it might take up. So different data structures will allocate different amounts of memory to do different kinds of tasks. Now, the analogy that I like to use when students are trying to write code is that Newer students have a tendency to just dive in and try to just start writing code. And the analogy I would use here is if you're a chemist and you're just like, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to hope for the best. I'm going to start pouring things into a beaker and see what happens. So you start, nothing happens. Wow, it did nothing. I should throw more chemicals in. This is going great. Wow, it exploded. Let's throw more chemicals in and see what happens. This is kind of how a lot of students will approach programming. And the issue is, the more you plan it out, the more likely you're gonna have a stronger programming skill set. And this is becoming really important in industry. So the citation that I have here from 1987 was done by the Department of Defense. I see all the midshipmen are water being used today. From the Department of Defense, one thing they saw is that students coming out of academia uh, were not really uh, capable of being able to develop long-term plans. And more importantly, being able to adjust to when something goes wrong. Now, a simple example of this is something that many of you encountered in homework two. So in homework two, I would write up, do I want your function to do this? And I emphasize this idea of modularity. And what would happening is, I would see students come in, and they would have written what was in that function, but then added a bunch of other stuff. And then they ran into a problem because that bunch of other stuff actually impacted the flow of the design. So, sorry, it's not cooperating with me. So the whole idea here is we want to be able to come up with effective ways to develop prototypes and software reuse. This is a huge part of computational thinking and why it is that we want to do .h and .c files for our functions. Because when you write a program or you write a library, you want people to be able to reuse it uh, rather quickly. And this is something that is really essential as we kind of move on. Now in 2015, Gaps in the Computer Science Curriculum and Exploratory Study of Industry Professionals. A clear need for students to understand process improvement frameworks and need employees who are, quote, much better at project related skills, good communication, time forecasting, and how to ask the right questions. This is what they were seeing from students coming out of. Here we go. All right, so, okay, there. And here's an example of where all of these things came together and resulted in disasters. You know, you've heard me talk about these production quality compilation rules and why I want to want you to you know, use them. And when I showed you an example of how the PQC rules prevent an attack called, it's called stacks, a stack smashing on Monday. But here's a higher level of when things like this can go wrong. So last year, the Boeing 737 MAX is deployed, and what they did is they had these sensors on the side of the plane. That was, that was the, uh, the maneuver characteristic augmentation system. What they did is they set, put in several tests. They went to the software engineers and said, here are constraints designed to these constraints, and the software engineers did exactly that. I want to emphasize that the software did not have a single bug. It, the software engineers did precisely what they were told to do. The problem is when you're doing this kind of project planning, you have to think about the impact throughout the entire design. 
when you're writing software, it's not just going to be software. The reason why these uh, are taking this course, why like aerospace engineers taking this course, chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, and you know, computer science uh, students. You have to think about how the software is going to impact the entire uh, design. So in this case, what happened is the 737 Max, they changed the design of the nodes from and with the objective of reducing drag in order to reduce the amount of fuel they would need to reduce flight costs. But they didn't tell the software engineers about the updated design of the nose cone. So what ended up happening is it was designed to the previous flight design. Now, what happened is, let me underline a crucial line here, certain situations would force the nose up. And so they had to design it to kind of push the nose down. Now, if you have the wrong nose design, that means you have the wrong situations where you want to push the nose down. So what ended up happening is, because they accounted, didn't account for the new nose, that, there we go, finally. Because they didn't account for the new nose, the software thought it was up when it wasn't, and kept forcing the plane down. And the pilots couldn't overcome it. So what ended up happening is the software, doing precisely what it's told to do, given the specific inputs that was given, caused the plane to crash. In fact, there were two crashes. Come on, there we go. So also you have to think about the end user. The pilots were not told about some of these features. So they kept trying to bring the nose of the plane back up and had no idea what was causing it and had no idea how to stop the software. So the software only counted for the sensors on the side of the plane. And this is the crucial part. This was a result of poor project planning. As aspiring engineering graduates, aspiring programmers, when you go out and leave Notre Dame and you go into industry, one crucial thing that you are going to bring to the table is using the skills that you've developed in your classes, of which one of these is a part, to apply computational thinking to strong project planning. If you can do that, you'll be far more valuable than anybody who can just, you know, do calculus and do programming. But you can apply this into an overall holistic approach, then you become a really strong programmer and an asset to whoever you're working for. That's why I emphasize here, MCAS was doomed before a single line of code was written. And so the question is, how can you apply this lesson to this class? So you have several other homework assignments. How can you make sure that the program that you write isn't doomed before you sit down and type a single character? So what I'm going to show you is several different approaches to how we would go about writing code. And this idea of modularity allows us to break down the program into several tests. You want to break it down into the smallest possible tests which means you have to think through what the tasks actually are. Are there opportunities for you to be able to use a function several times to perform the same subtask? And here I have written the write compile test method. Everything we've written so here kind of qualifies under a small program. We're not involving million line code databases where we're compiling big things in which you're checking in some code through GitHub or something like that. We're rel you're writing a relatively small program. And we're trying to write, we try to compile, and we see if the code actually works. And as some of you are undoubtedly familiar with, it takes several iterations to get it to work correctly. So the question is, how can you figure out how to reduce these number of iterations with project planning? Furthermore, as these programs get more and more complicated, kind of doing this right compiling test can be more and more challenging to the point where it would be prohibitive. So instead, we have to write programs in a manner that will help ensure that errors are caught or avoided. So 
So this idea of decomposition and modularity, you can also think of it in the same kind of way that we did merge sort, divide and conquer. If you break it into small pieces, that means you can test those small pieces out and then implement them into your program. So if you know that if your program is supposed to work through a certain range, get a certain number of inputs and return a specific result, then you know that I can eliminate that as a potential problem. If I'm getting a rough loss, an incorrect result at a higher level, I can now troubleshoot down to specifically where the issue is. And then sub sub problems. Let's see. Uh, okay, so top down design. Top down design is we know what the project is going to do at a high level, and then we start decomposing. And then we see what we can do in terms of writing these results. Program stubs, well, I'll get to program stubs in a moment. So the idea in which a large problem is broken down into several pieces, dividing and conquering. So we begin with the top level, which is always run at main. So those of you who have had the linger error uh, that describes that you're on it, it's, it's an empty program, and you found out that it didn't have a main function, or that your um, main file wasn't referring to the right program, a right file for main. So you start at main, and then main breaks down to everything else. Each function can be thought of as a subproblem. And the whole idea is when you break it down into smaller problems, you're eventually going to break it down small enough that each of the problems becomes relatively easy to solve. So instead of getting intimidated with this really large uh, problem, break it down into smaller pieces. And once you break it down into smaller pieces, you're going to go, okay, well, maybe I don't know how to write. Um, I'm just trying to think of this. Okay, so in the data structures class today, I'm teaching them graphs. So the graph, the idea of a graph is that you have several uh, pieces of information and several pointers pointing in several different directions, right? And so if I were to say, write a graph and give me an algorithm that finds the shortest path between two nodes in the graph. Well, if I just start out that, I just try to solve it from step one and doing right compiling the test, that can be very, very challenging and probably scary and frustrating, especially when you have several other classes and we're going through a pandemic and all life happens. Well, what you should do is go, okay, well, how do I break this down into several different problems? And eventually you're gonna get it to the point where once you organize it, it's just gonna be several small problems that you know how to solve. And once you get it down to that point, then you can actually start building up and then build your full program. So here's a good diagram of how top-down design works. So let's say your main function would call three problems of which each of those problems can be broken down into several different terms. So these two terms I here I have are depth first search and breadth first search. And these are two different ways to kind of approach these tasks. So a depth first search, it's like if you're going through a maze, and in the maze, you only know the certain room you're in, right? So I know that I came from a certain place and I have several different options, and then I would go down one hallway, I would get to the next place and keep making a decision until I find out there's no further way for me to go, in which case I start backtracking. So let's say I was trying to find a path from one to 12. Depth first search would say, well, I'll go to two, then I'll go to five, can't go any further. Then I go back to two, I'll go to six. Then I go up here, it's three, seven, eight, 11, then nine, then I'll go four, 10, and 12. So that's why we see one, two, five, six, three, seven, eight, 11, nine, four, 10, and 12. Does that make sense to everybody? So this is a good way of trying to break down problems. Once you figure out your problem, you can attack it in a depth first search way. Go through and try to see which problems you can solve first. So you might go through and go, all right, once I go this way and I know I solve problem five, well, I can't solve problem two until I solve problem six. 
and then I can work my way up. And I know with problem three, well, can't solve problem three without solving problem seven. Go down to eight. Well, I can't solve problem eight until I solve problem 11. And I still can't solve problem three until I solve problem nine. Now I've got problem three solved. So now I do four. Well, I got to solve problem 10, but first I got to solve problem 12. And that's the duck first search approach. Whereas with breadth first search, you kind of come up with an order of which you would need to do your tasks. This is more if you're trying to solve a maze, but you had a map. And you map, you would say, well, all of my possible ways of going here are this way, right? And then I'd want to keep track, and I would say one, two, three. Then I'd evaluate where I can go after this. So that would be five and six. Where can I go from three? Seven, eight, nine. Then four would go to 10. And then from, I say, well, five, I can't go anywhere else. Six, seven, eight, I do 11. And then from 10, I do 12. So the whole idea is can I come up with, and this should be a four here, some sort of plan to break down these, now that I've broken down these problems, come up with some sort of plan and attack in order to solve them. And so you can say, well, you might say these are the easiest or these are the easiest, but once you figure out a certain path, then it will be much easier for you to work on your programming assignments. The other, and this is something that I do a lot, is using stubs. So once you get to your sub problems, what I will do is I will write a stub function, which is basically a test function of that specific function, right? So let's say, let's go back to homework two, and we are doing this calculator where we would take in a location and then we would take in some sort of, based on the calculation, we bring in some sort of input that we do for the user and we use that to calculate the temperature, the time. So what I would do is I would say, right, well, my smallest task is I'm getting several inputs, I got the time, and then I come up with some sort of approach to do that. I would write some sort of function, maybe test time where I would come up with a test suite to test that function and see if every input that I put in gives me the expected results. And then I do the same thing for test Celsius. Okay, well, now that I have those, well, how do I read them in? Well, then I could read in, I write my read in function, and then I would test that and say, well, user reads these in. I could write those same tests, but now I'm entering them in. So now I'm seeing that I can build it up piece by piece. From there, I would test all of these different elements. And that's where you, you would say a stripped down skeletal version of main is written. So in projects that I would submit, I would have all these commented functions in my main function because I would start out testing from the bottom and then come up. And by the end, I would only have a few functions in main, but I'd have several other commented out, but I know it works and that's how I tested it. And then a driver is where you can start figuring out how to integrate those pieces. So the stubs are at the bottom, and now the drivers are our tests to be able to figure out how bigger pieces are working. And then I want to emphasize here, it's not necessarily the best design methodology to apply this in a larger test suite. But what's good at your level where you're programming is that you can start to get this idea of testing. So Students will come back from internships, and the one thing they'll say is, oh, man, I really wish I'd pay attention more when you're talking about testing. Because testing in industry is almost 45, 50% of what you do in code. It's a significant portion. And there's not that much glory in it, but because it's so important, because if you do it, you can do things like preventing uh, the 737 max explosion, you're well, very well compensated. So if this is a skill that you can build, over time through programming, and you can say that I have quantifiable testing skills, that makes you much more employable than somebody who can just say, oh, okay, I can write some function that 
reads in the time and uh, reads in the location and gives me the time in Celsius. Okay, before I continue, let me check to see if uh, there are any questions in the chat. All right, so code and fix. So some of you are probably, as I'm going on this and talking about it, going, oh no, that was me, that said that took me so much time. And you probably recognize the scenario that's here with the grumpy capture where you, had, you thought you had it down to one error, you fixed the error, and then suddenly now you've got several more. So sometimes the compiler will encounter an error that says, okay, before we do anything else, we need to stop, we need to fix that, and then I can actually figure out what the rest of the programming is trying to do. So the crucial part for class projects and in the real world, a fix that you might make may end up having an unintended consequences that may harm your program much later on. So you think you did something about solve this little issue, but in a higher level, as we build up our hierarchy tree, it ends up causing you more work. So sometimes it gets so bad that you just gotta start all over again. And, oh, I have no idea. I've completely lost track of what my program is doing. I'm just going to start from scratch. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to help you avoid that. You know, you're, you're completing the programs faster is in your benefit. It's also in my benefit. I'd like to see you be able to complete programs fast. So here I even have the thing. A student will get frustrated and have to restart the program. program. So you want to make sure that we design first. So this thing that you say, hear me say about design so in the history of computers, the word computer first came out in 1618, long before we had any of these machines. And it was a reference to, it was actually it was in a, a little book called The Young Man's Leaning. And the whole idea is I've met, I read the truest computer of times, and it is said that, that it calculates that the days of man are uh, three score and ten which is basically saying that uh, I've read the Bible and it says that humans are limited in the time they live. It's approximately 70 years. So as an appeal to be humble as a, as a human, uh, instead of uh, being uh, arrogant. And so in the same kind of way, we compute. Ultimately, these computers, these laptops, these desktops, and the phones, they do what we tell them to do. But unfortunately, that doesn't always mean that they do what we want them to do. So we, the computers, tell the machines what to do. So the more you compute before you tell it what to do, the more likely it is that the computer, that the laptop is going to do what you, the computer, want it to do. So therefore, better design, better programmer, less time spent on coding projects, more time uh, getting to go to Notre Dame games. Okay. All right, so another type of approach to design, so these are two that were built off of each other, uh, stage-wise and waterfall. And the whole idea of stage-wise, first we do project planning. We kind of sit out and go, okay, what's the plan? And then we start designing. So waterfall is a little different in that has feedback loops because the whole idea of building a good design plan is to account for what happens when we realize that our original design did not work. Oh, this is a bad idea. So now what I can do is I can do loop back and say, well, all right, I'm going to design. But then once we get a little better, we want to progress a little further. We want to start implementing our code. So once you start doing implementation, then more issues are going to reveal themselves, and we have to revisit our design, and perhaps even go back to planning. So after we start doing implementation, now we start doing unit testing. So being able to test parts of the code to ensure their effectiveness. And so each time in this waterfall design, you're going to see that there are opportunities to assess that it's not correct. 
And this is where you can go back and say, well, now that I have documented out my design and I understand what's actually going on, this allows me to say, all right, what went wrong? Is it how I'm implementing the code? Is it how I designed the code? Is it a fundamental flaw in how we've planned everything? Then we go to subsystem tests. So the subsystem tests, for example, for homework two, you would test, okay, I want to do just Celsius. I want to do just temperature. I want to do just time. And then finally, we get to integration testing. When we put all those together, you put that into your while loop, then your, for most of you, you use switch statements. And so you test and put them all together and make sure nothing funky happens when you put them all together that you did not anticipate. And then finally, you evaluate. So you have a final test suite where you're going through and you're testing all these different portions and seeing if it all works together as you anticipate. And so the difference between stage-wise and waterfall is that we have opportunities to evaluate. So there's a need for a strong emphasis on interfacing. But we're going to see that there's an issue with this kind of design. Does anybody have any questions before I continue? So the big issue with this design is that as we are building up more and more code, this approach, the waterfall method, makes, makes our code susceptible to a phenomenon known as spaghetti code. So does anybody know what spaghetti code actually is? Can you make, do you think you can make an educated guess just off, just based off of the idea of spaghetti? Uh, so say here's, oh yes, so you want, wanted to. Yeah, it all goes together, it doesn't, the flow doesn't make any sense, is that what you're gonna say? The opposite of modularity, very good. I like both of your answers. So the opposite of modularity is it's so intertwined, it's really hard to just pick out what it is that this code is actually supposed to do. And so with the waterfall method, you start adding more and more things. And as a result, the code just gets convoluted. And when you come in as an employee trying to figure out what the code does, right? I want to read up on the code base. What is this going on? What, what is this mess? This is this is insane, <laughs> right? And now I haven't, I, I probably should have taken out this line, but I'll briefly allude to it. So Bjarne Strachstra uh, invented the programming language we're going to learn in the second half of the semester. And up to this point in C, we've been focusing very procedural. We allocate this, we do this, we get this on the output. And that's one of those really strong benefits of this programming language. And if you're mapping it to a specific device, it's very effective. However, the early source saw C as kind of ideologically limited. He actually uh, was inspired to write C++ based on the philosophy of Soren Kierkegaard. And he felt that being told what to do was very harmful to people. Like right? having to do exactly what you were told, that's what tyrants do. And you're probably like, Dr. Morrison, you tyrant. <laughs> Right? But he wanted to be able to adapt. And what ends up happening is we try to adapt these elaborate specification documents, but now it's we just have a bunch of documents that are hard to read, it's hard to understand, and you have more and more code that people don't understand, which means they're trying to fix it, but which means other people don't understand that code, and that becomes really problematic. So the goal is you want to have avoid large quantities of unusable code. You want your code and your assignments to do precisely what you want it to do, and ideally, you would like to react to the precise number of lines to do what you need to do. So this is where we bring in spiral software development. Spiral software development kind of came out of that study that was done by the Department of Defense. It was introduced by uh, Barry Bohm, who we can all boo. He is a currently a professor at USC. Ooh, of course, they're not playing this year, so. Uh, um, anyway, so the whole idea with what they're doing is they want to integrate these large projects 
with the Department of Defense. And it really started being implemented in uh, the Navy Trident program. I happen to know this because my father worked on it, Notre Dame alumni, and now he's now you're learning what his lessons are for. The whole idea is we want to have reliable efficiency uh, throughout the entire design. And in order to do this, we have to simultaneously consider four main things. The first part is actually being able to identify the objectives. What is it that this, uh, we want this project to be able to actually do? Okay. Pretty straightforward. Then, once you've identified the objectives, you start trying to identify risks and alternatives. And this is where you apply your computational thinking. This is one of the reasons why it's so important for you to understand pointers and memory. So how last lecture I was telling you about why the GETS method has all these issues with stack smashing. You understand that because you understand how memory is allocated, you understand hexadecimal, and you understand how the data heap works, and you understand that there was a security exploit, and you now know how to fix it. So you know the risks because you're fundamental understanding of the, of the computer and how to code. And then alternatives. We're going to be learning about actually different methods to read in that are safer next week. So the next part is product development. I've identified risks, things we want to avoid. I've identified alternatives, things that I want to implement. And then let's actually start trying to do it, right? Now let's actually implement it, let's apply our knowledge, and then plan for the next phase. So planning for the next phase, what this means is, all right, I've identified some risks and alternatives, I have written some code, and we ran into some problems. Didn't quite work how I hoped. So now, you keep going, Based on what you learn, you now identify a new set of objectives. And based on that new set of objectives, you now update your risks and alternatives. Then you do another product implementation. And then based on what you've learned, then you go through again. And on the spiral, you will see that it starts going out. And that is a representation of cost. So we have time, we have cost. Now, I'm not going to make you uh, do anything that requires funding for coding. Plus, but you know, <laughs> uh, you all have to pay me fifty dollars to pass. So, um, but in that kind of thing, you have to bear in mind that there are constraints on the costs when you get into industry. So it's the some of the benefits to you to understand this. It's not just code and fix. It's like okay, well, I have a goal, I'm the right program, I'm submit it, and get it. What you should be learning from this class beyond what the grade that I give you is, is how to adapt when things don't go quite right. Computational thinking at its core is being able to adapt to challenges. So in this case, identifying the objective. What, what is being done and how do I try to do this, do this with my engineering skills? Based on what I've learned in school, what are the risks? What are the challenges? What are, what, how is it effective to do this? How is it ineffective to do that? Then I actually try to do it. And then if things don't go quite right, you come back to the table and say, well, this is the lesson we learned. Now, Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, but he also invented 9,000 ways to not do it, right? So that's a key portion of actual engineering design. So. Okay, so that, that didn't come out as well as I had hoped. I'm just going to skip over that slide. Okay, so the benefits to the new programmer, don't just write it in and write the entire project. It can barely come back to bite you. You made an early mistake. Build piecewise and test each method. Don't plug and chug unfamiliar or untested code. And each pro opportunity, so in the short term, each opportunity when you're playing this out is an opportunity to see if you get to a point where, okay, I came up with these objectives, I weighed the risks and alternatives, I wrote some code, and it doesn't work, and I don't know why, that's an opportunity to bug me or the TX, right? So now, what you have is a set of plans 
that allow you to be able to meet an objective in a way that is applying engineering thinking, but bringing it just beyond write code, submit assignment. And I have this great piece of advice, uh, Colonel Vicky back in the day, Marine, bad news only gets rotten with age. The moment you find something, you should address it. And this method and computational thinking allows you to address issues as they come up. And the longer you wait, the worse things get. Okay. So I would say, I'll give you an example. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, so I'll give you an example. When I, ha I had the opportunity to do uh, several research fellowships, and I did one in a company called Cadence Design Systems. And you had to dig through their software database to solve several problems that they were trying to address with hardware synthesis. And I was the type of person, I'm the type of person that if something I don't understand, what I will do is I'll say, well, I looked here, I looked here, I looked here, and I still can't quite find the solution to X, can you point me in the right direction? And I was a pest, but soon enough, I was producing the requirements on the job, right? About halfway through the fellowship, the person I was working with got fired because he never sought help. And it got to the point where, hey, we have deliverables. Where are they? Where are you? Suddenly, it was too late because they didn't seek the help. So applying these methods allows you to identify, okay, I can't come up with a new set of risks or alternatives until I get more information. Another crucial part, how much is enough? So another thing, if you come into my office hours, you may have seen in the top right corner on my whiteboard, I have a little, okay, if anybody's in my office, does anybody know that little thing that I have in the top right corner? I know I've told it to multiple people in the class, yeah. Exactly right, better is the enemy of good enough. We are engineers, we are creative, we like being able to build things, we really like making things that are cool. So if you add if you write some code that does a bunch of cool stuff, but doesn't do the thing that the customer wanted, is it, about, is it a useful program? No. So off, the reason why I have better is the enemy of good enough on the top of my board is because we tend to, we all fall into that trap. Me especially, right? We all fall in that trap. We're like, oh, this would be really cool. We did this, we did this, we did this. But we have to make sure that through our design processes, we actually meet the customer specifications. So you don't want to lose scope. You don't want to add a bunch of unnecessary features. And we do this by identifying the objectives, the risks and alternatives, actually implementing, and then evaluating those challenges. So once you deliver what it is that you need to do, then you can go back to your customer and say, oh, I actually have a bunch of several other ideas. And they either can go, that's really cool. I'd like to see how that works. Or as you'll get in a lot of cases, you know what? I really just want a program that does that. Please leave it alone. And that's good. We want to be able to do those kind of things. So uh, in the goal here, basically what I've lectured about today is developing a, a viable framework for integrated hardware and software. You have to consider hardware and software together. One of the reasons why they ask, they, they ask electrical engineers to take this class because it's like okay you can learn a lot of stuff with logic design you've done stuff with embedded systems and you have to make the code and the hardware play well and likewise we have to think about other tasks one of the reasons why to, okay so this is a good place to talking about the production quality so when you've written code in the pqc flags if you allocated a variable and then never used it, you get the error message that says unused variable and it doesn't let you run the program. The reason why is because if you allocate a variable, that's actually using memory. Okay? Or if you allocate an array, that's using a lot of memory. We want to make sure that the program is doing precisely what we want it to do with the memory you want. So if you're using a program on a device that has a lot of limited memory, a good programmer knows not to use up that memory because it will actually degrade the performance. 
Furthermore, if you're not uh, writing the code properly, you can actually inadvertently use way too much power. And as we've learned just last uh, just Monday, that you apply your knowledge also improves the security of the program. And we showed an example of how to apply your knowledge of pointers to prevent stack smashing. Okay, so does anybody have any questions? Okay, we don't have anything in the chat. Uh, does anybody have anything, any questions about any of this stuff that I've discussed? Okay, um, in that, on that note, um, I wish you all the best of luck in studying, and I will see you all on Friday.